Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Again, welcome to lecture number two of the level three umpires course. Um, just like to welcome everyone and uh, hope everyone is keeping well. Uh, like previously mentioned at the end of our course on Monday, we'll start off with a few revision slides. I'm just going through some of the answers that we've been through just to touch touch base on that and then um, go into a few more of those revision questions that we did not get to. And then after we'll start off with the lectures this evening. So we'll start off with law 19 and we'll try and get through to law 24 this evening, uh, as well as just go through a few revision questions. And thereafter we can we can end off the session. I am going to start. I have started recording. I am going to start sharing my screen. If uh, perhaps uh, you can please inform me if uh, you can see the presentation. Again, we would like to thank uh, Western Province Cricket Umpires Association for the presentation that they have uh, provided and the support they have given uh, to us at KZN Inland uh, in terms of doing the first time we are doing the level three lecture. Hey, I hope that everyone can see my screen. I'm going to make it slightly uh, bigger when it comes to the sharing. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, just to begin this evening, it's some of the questions that we went through last, uh, sorry, on Monday. So in a three day match, uh, the close of play on day one is at 5.30. Team A is all out at 17.22, so at 22 minutes past five with four overs still to be bowled. What would happen next? So we know that if 10 minutes or less remains before the agreed time uh, for the close of play on any day, there should be no further play on that day and no time, no change shall be made to the start of the next day's play. So again, you won't start early on the next day just because you could not, uh, or just because you finished uh, eight to 10 minutes earlier. So just take notes of that. See, okay, lunch is scheduled from 12.20 to 1 o'clock. So you got, again, 40 minute lunch so standard. The captain of the batting side declares its innings closed at 12.55. What would happen next? If less than 10 minutes remains for the, of the interruption, uh, when the captain declares the innings closed or free forfeits an innings, the next inning shall commence 10 minutes after the declaration of forfeiture is made. Okay. Again, so at 12.55, because he declared at that time, you'd start at 13.05, 10 minutes, all right? After the declaration in this particular case, it wasn't a forfeiture. Okay, lunch is scheduled. Uh, so question number three, lunch is scheduled from 12.20, again, uh, the 40-minute lunch. At 12.05, it starts to rain and the players have occasion to leave the field. What would happen next? If the players have occasion to leave the field for any reason, when when more than 10 minutes, in this particular case, it's 15 minutes, more than 10 minutes remains before the agreed time for lunch. And unless the umpires and captains together agree to alter it, the lunch will be taken at the agreed time. So again, agreed time will be 12.20. Again, in this particular case, you may engage with them, but again, uh, that's up to together with the, both the umpires and captains. All right, question number four. In a three day test, in a three day match, T is scheduled from 15.20 to 15.40. So a 20 minute T interval. And a team A is all out at 14.55. What would you do next? If an innings ends when 30 minutes or less it remains before the agreed time for the T interval, the interval shall be taken immediately. It shall be of the agreed duration and shall be considered to be include the 10 minute interval. So again, like we mentioned, you will not extend T now, but I make it 30 minutes just because you need to have a change of innings. That 10 minutes is absorbed within the 20 minute T interval. All right. Okay, another 40 minute lunch is scheduled from 12.20 to 1 o'clock. At 12.17, Team A loses the ninth wicket. So what happens now? Okay, for the lunch interval, if either nine wickets are already down when three minutes or less. So again, here scheduled at 1220, 
So 12.17, which is within three minutes. OK, when three minutes remains to the agreed time for the interval or the knife wicket falls within this three minutes. So if I'm 12.17 to 12.20, the knife wicket had fallen. Or at any time up to and including the final ball of the over in progress at the agreed time for the interval, the interval will not be taken until the end of that over that is in progress 30 minutes after the originally agreed time for the interval. So it will move up to 12.50. OK, unless the players, of course, to leave the field, it could rain in that particular time or the innings is completed earlier. So if the 10th wicket falls, then you would you would have course to leave the field and you'll obviously leave the field because the innings is completed. Right. So we started here uh, on slide number six. We stopped here actually on slide number six, and uh, I said this evening we'll go through slide six to slide uh, slide ten, which deals with um, the last hour, etc. So I'd like to go to the floor when uh, I ask some of these questions. So, and I hope you guys have been through some of the lectures that I uploaded onto uh, YouTube. But again, I will send you guys the links if you guys would like it. Um, so some of the members that are here would have got that. The last hour starts at five o'clock. All right, at five, 17, 10, at five, 10 past five, after 2.2 overs, so two overs and two balls have been bowled, there is a rain interruption. Okay, play resumes uh, 13 minutes later. Okay, so remember in the last hour, please take note, according to law, when we've been through the presentation, it's 20 overs in the last hour. So again, 20 divided by 60. Simple mathematics, three minutes and over. All right, so I'd like to go to the floor. Can we start off with Dane? Uh, what would happen next Dane, in terms of your uh, overs remaining within the, the last hour that is currently in progress? Yeah, um, I think that because um, they went off at 1710 and play resumes at 1723, they've they've lost 13 minutes. Um, so therefore, based on three minutes and over, um, four overs would be lost. So therefore, 13.4 overs would be remaining in the day, minimum. Okay, so what we're saying is we've obviously started off at five o'clock. We have 20 overs, okay? 2.2 .2 have been bowled. So that leaves us with 17.4, 17 .4. yeah. Okay. 17.4 and you are saying now minus a further 14 oh, sorry my, my minus a further four which leaves us with 13.4 overs remaining is that correct yes that's what i'm saying yes all right let's see what the answer says okay so we, uh, again you'll show your step-by-step -step calculation with regards to this so again four four mark question if you get a question like this similar in the exam so just take note of that something that um I just like to touch on we had a we had an exam now for the members that did the training and um it was brought to our attention that one should focus on the mark allocation uh in terms of the laws of cricket it does give you for example like with no ball when you call and signal no ball note every single time you would do that or when it becomes an automatic uh, when it, when it's when it's a no ball or dead ball etc uh you'd you'd state all of those so let's go step by step in this calculation all right, so again, we know your time is from five o'clock to six o'clock. So we, we're happy over it is fine. 20 overs remains now for the last hour. You've shown the signal to the everyone. 20 overs remain. OK, so 13 minutes are lost. We're happy with that from 1710 to 1723. Overs lost again, 13 divided by three. So you take again, like I mentioned earlier, three minutes and over my divided by the number of minutes lost. 4.33 you round down obviously because you want more cricket so less overs lost in the in inverted commas so that's four overs overs ball was 2.2 okay and you have now like the steps that we've done now so again i skipped all the top top steps so we got 20 minus 4 minus 2.2 is 13.4 overs remaining okay well done then all right so you have to complete your over You'll, you'll go back when you do go back. That same bowler will complete his over with the four balls, and then remaining overs will then be bowled from uh, opposite sides, etc. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Question two. So the last hour starts at 1700. Again, everyone happy? At 1719. So at 1719, after five overs have been bowled, 
So 19 minutes have gone, five overs, and team A is bowled out, with team B now requiring 64 runs to win. All right, so like we mentioned here, so at, at interval, or sorry, a changeover uh, in between innings is maximum of 10 minutes. So it's 10 minutes or minimum of 10 minutes. Um, and you would you would go on from there. Uh, can I ask Dawood Mehta, you on the call, uh, would you like to attempt this? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Juma. Okay, so we're saying the last hour starts at 17 and 17 and like after five overs have been bowled. So basically the last hour minimum of 20, so five have been bowled. Uh, so we have a minimum of 15 remains. Team A is bowled. Okay, so um, your 10 minutes change over. So we're saying three minutes per over. So um, that will be three overs lost, which you got to take into consideration. So five have been bowled. Three have been due to change over. So that is five plus three is eight. Team B will require 64 runs to win of 12 overs minimum for the last hour. All right. So before I, I move on to the answer, I just like to find out from you what time would you restart or what time would you commence the second innings? So it would be. So the second innings would start. So your, your time, so 1729 will be, should start. Uh, your 10 minutes starts immediately from the fall of the last wicket. All right, that's correct. So at 1729, you'd come on and you have. For the 12 overs to be bold. All right, let's see what the answer says. So again, five mark, uh, five mark question, as you can see. So quite a quite a lengthy answer you'd have to give in this particular case, and the teachers on this class can, on this group, will be able to know that how important these steps are. Remember, guys, when you get, you may not get the whole answer correct, but if you do step by step, uh, at least the marker or the, the the person assessing the paper will be able to see where you are going with your thought process. So, let's start. Five more question. Okay, states that if an innings ends after the last hour has started, two calculations are to be made. The greater of the numbers yielded by these two calculations is to be the minimum number of overs we bowl in the innings. So remember, we got an a calculation of time and a calculation of overs, which you do separately. So let's do this. Let's continue. On overs remaining, so I think that would you went on overs remaining, uh, if I'm not mistaken, where you went by 20 minus five that were bold in the 19 minutes, and then 20 minus, uh, and then you took that 15 and minus the further three of three minutes and over times three uh, for the changeover, which gave you 12. All right. At the conclusion of the innings, the number of overs that remain to be bold of the minimum in the last hour is to be noted. Okay. If it is not a whole number, it is to be rounded up to the next whole number, All right? Three overs for the interval. Well done. So you did get it correct to be deducted from the resulting number to determine number of overs to be bold. So 15 remaining, like we discussed, minus three for the changeover, 12 overs to be bold. So well done. OK, if we go on time, OK? So again, I'm going to go through this because not many do time crickets and even uh, now, as well as you go higher up, most of the of the national weeks, uh, be it under 16 where your union selects you or by where um, you may get to under 19 where Cricket South Africa select you, it is still um, it is still predominantly 50 over cricket. So again, just take note of that. All right, so 10 minutes for the interval to be deducted from the time determined for the remaining. All right, a calculation should be made of one over for every complete three minutes of playing time remaining, plus one over for further three minutes that remains. So last hour we know is 60 minutes from five o'clock to six o'clock. OK. From so you take your end time minus what was played thus far, 41 minutes left. OK, minus an innings change. Now you're going to you're going now down to 31 minutes because 1729 you're going to restart. So that's a, that's why I was trying to get to how, what time would you restart? And how many minutes are left? All right, so you've got 31 minutes now remaining. Remember also here, guys, you can also pick out if a team is actually behind and stuff like that. OK, so 31 minutes divided. Uh, so again, you would take 31 divided by 3 is 10.3. 10 overs plus the 1 over because you want to round up. 1 over if, uh, for every part thereof is 11 overs. 
So which one was bigger? Obviously, our always remaining was bigger. All right. You use the greatest number of the two, so the always remaining was 12. All right. So again, you can see if you're going to go on this, uh, that they are slightly maybe in the over eight. But again, guys, please just make sure when it comes to this, that if you do get time, click it, use your playing conditions. Um, now in the playing conditions for the four day, it is 16 overs in the hour, in the last hour as well. Um, but they are trying to push 16 overs in the hour in general for the for the four day competition. So just take note of that even if you are shadowing, etc. All right. So I'll just go back. Just wanted to see the slide number. I do apologize. So okay, this is number nine. So yeah. Hey, this is when it comes to follow on, guys. We did discuss this. All right. So team A scores 450 in the first innings. Remember what I said when it comes to a five day, four day, uh, four and three, and then two and one uh, time cricket. So just take note of that when it comes to that. So again, we're saying here in a four day provincial match, team A, the bowl, uh, they bowl out the opposition. So team A scores 450 in the first innings of a four day, right? They bowl out the opposition for 303. So again, you take, you'll take you'll mark that down. The capture of team A informs you that he wants team B to follow on. So again, you'll take 450. Uh, okay, let me ask a question. Let me, let me rather go down to the floor. Um, ben, I know you may not have been on our course in the last uh, in the last uh, session, uh, but would you like to have a go at this one? Yeah, I can do it if you want. Yes, please. So the deficit between the two sides is 147 runs, and the minimum uh, lead that a team can have to enforce a follow-on in a four-day match is 150 runs. So therefore the follow-on would not be allowed to be enforced. Perfect. All right. So, you uh, guys, I hope everyone understood that. So, when you get a five-day, it's 200. Well, then, Ben, on the four-day and three-day is 150. Okay? And then you obviously got your 100, and, and then you got your one uh, one-day time cricket. All right. So, let's see what the answer is and how what is how we will answer that in a question paper. Okay. The minimum lead in a four-day match is 150 runs. Team A leads Team B after the completion is 147. So the option of taking team B is not available. So you'll inform the captain. Please know that this is not available. Again, you'd, you'd see it on the scoreboard. Um, you'll be able to pick it out from there. Um, and you can inform him and obviously there after he has to come back and do that. All right. So in terms of um, in terms of info, informing the captain, informing China, informing him immediately. Um, you'd, it's a simple calculation. You'll be able to work out. Um, you'll see sometimes if you're a bigger stadium, you'll see the lead, etc., whereby it states uh, what the lead is, what runs to get, and then you'll be able to work it out from there. All right, so the last one, this is now slide number 10, which you said we'll stop for today. Team A scores 600 in the first innings of a three-day provincial match. So now from th from four, we've gone to three-day. All right, so now we, uh, we, we're playing Colts cricket. Team A scores 600 in the first innings of a three-day provincial match. They bowl out the opposition for 450 and team A informs you that he wants team B to follow on. So I know Nikhil, you uh, Vic, actually you were on the session last week. Let's so why don't you have a go? Welcome Vic. Uh, Vic, can you hear us? Yeah, I think Vic is having trouble with uh, with hearing us. Uh, Tish, would you like to have a go? I'd like to welcome Tish, one of our newest uh, level threes. Uh, thanks down to Western Province Umpire Association. Uh, Tish completed his level three recently through them. Um, welcome, Tish. Hey, I think I may be having issues. I don't know if it's my side. Dane, can you hear me? I can hear you, Fon. Oh, would you like to have a go? I think your mic is working better than most. Maybe um, load shedding in the areas. Okay, I'll, because it's a three-day match, um, a minimum of 150 run lead is required to do the follow-on. And in this case, um, Team A has a lead of 150, so they've reached the minimum amount, so they would be allowed to follow on. 
Okay, well done. The minimum in the lead in a three day is 150. Like we said, three and four day, 150. Okay, team A leads by 150 after the completion of the first innings of team B. So the captain and team A shall have the option, okay, of enforcing the follow on. Doesn't mean they have to take it, they have the option, operative word being option. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to start off with our presentation for this evening. Uh, I will I will give you guys an opportunity at the end of the session to ask some questions. And uh, so we'll start off with law 19 this evening. If you could give me a second or two, I will swap over the uh, slides. All right, uh, Dane, since your your mic is working quite well, and Nikhil, if you guys can just confirm you can see that. I yes. Brilliant. All right, so this evening, uh, as you can see, the video was the last one we watched on Monday evening. So, guys, we're going to start off with Law 19 boundaries. Again, in your level one uh, and two examinations, you may have seen that... Uh, marking the boundary and how you mark the boundary etc the inner part of the rope and the inner part of the line etc is is what uh, how you how you determine a boundary but we're going to more in depth now during your your level three all right so overthrow a willful act of a fielder all right so again we get this many times and you'd notice uh, in in world cups and anywhere uh, you get this i mean you get this at club level all the time if the boundary results from an overthrow or from the willful act of a fielder, the run scored shall be. And uh, just to take note of this, um, guys, it's on this. This was the last week's question, actually, from Babs on our quiz group. So just take note of this, whereby a fielder was running and 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 obviously we had a willful act, etc. So just take note of this. It's nice to join that group while I'm on this. Okay, so if the boundary results from an overthrow or willful act of a fielder, the run scored shall be any runs for penalties awarded to either side. The allowance for the boundary, so if there's an overthrow, your allowance for the boundary, so if you had, for example, there was a no ball, uh, he hit it, uh, they took one, and, and then the overthrow came in for a boundary while they're running, obviously you get the, you, you get by drift, it'll be, it'll be the boundary will be scored. And the runs completed by the batsman together with the run in progress, if they had crossed at the instant of the throw or act. All right. Let's take a quick look at the video. I uh, please let me know if you can hear the sound. Uh, there's no sound. Sounds Sorry, I'll just try and reshare that with my computer audio. I do apologize. I did not computer audio on. All righty, I think I have now. Uh, let's give it a go. What do you say? Can't worry about it. Quick single. That's well taken. Oh, and I think that's hit the bat of McCullum. It's going to go for uh, four, so that'll be five to the total. And uh, a little bit of good fortune. Well, the first boundary does come, though uh, not necessarily in the way that uh, any of us would have expected. Yes, yeah, a little bit unorthodox. McCullum, very good runner between the wickets, and he was always going to be okay throw was well wide and that's just a nicely bonus as a batsman at times you're hoping that the throw will skim off okay so i'm just going to replay that and if someone can just tell me how many runs they would have given can't worry about it quick single that's well taken oh, and i think that's hit the bat of mccullum it's going to go for uh, four so that'll be five to the total 
and uh, a little bit of good fortune while the first boundary does come, though uh, not necessarily in the way that uh, any of us would have expected. Yes, a little bit unorthodox. McCullum, very good runner between the wickets, and he was always going to be okay. The throw was well wide, and that's just a nice wee bonus. As a batsman, at times you're hoping that the throw will skim off. All right, so the, the commentator gave it away, but again, yeah, you guys, you, you now get the how it works with regards to also the signaling, guys. You obviously will signal, as you can see, Commodore Messina signal four. And then he will just signal five to the with the back of the hand to the scorers. All right. So now we get on to law 20, which is dead ball. OK, uh, this is quite important. Um, and we'll just deal with the major things within the dead ball law. OK, so the ball becomes dead when. OK, this is now when it becomes sort of automatically dead. It is finally settled in the hands of the wicket keeper or the bowler. A boundary scores, so nothing else can happen from there on. A batsman is dismissed, so it's not like last man stands cricket or anything like that, where two batters can get dismissed. It's one batter. Okay, whether played or not becomes trapped between the bat and person of a batter or between items of, of his or her clothing or equipment. So again, like sometimes you always hear in junior cricket, they get where it goes in between the pad, especially for the youngsters, and they say, catch it, catch it, or take it out, take it out, guys. It is obviously a dead ball, automatic dead ball. Please take note of that, especially when you're doing junior cricket. Uh, a lot of us are still doing ju junior cricket and coming up and, and within the league structures. So just take note of that. Coaches don't know that a lot. Okay, whether played or not, lodges in the clothing equipment of the batsman or clothing of an umpire. There is an award of penalty runs under a player returning without permission. So get that one. You give five penalty runs, etc. You do all of that. But again, why? We play a return without permission because nothing can happen there after no run out, etc. can happen. Okay. And the ball shall not count as one of the over in that particular instance. There is a contravention of the protective helmet. So when it hits the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side that's lying on behind the wicket keeper, you always see. Obviously, it mustn't be it could, could hit the helmet and go off to another fielder, and next thing the guy gets run out. No. All right. The match is concluded. Uh, that's that's quite simple. So I think here, guys, is is something to take note of. If you need one, say you need one or two runs to win, and I would I would say one run to win in this in the scenario I'm about to give, and in that the batsman complete the one run, all right, and a boundary is obviously scored. We just dealt with boundaries, so let me say the ball goes over the boundary, but they've completed the one run. Please take note that the match is concluded upon that one run. All right, because they've completed and made good their ground, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the match is concluded on the one run. A lot of times you might see the batter might be on 46, uh, substantial number of overs still to be bowled, and they need one or two runs to win, and they complete that while the ball is trickling over, not realizing that hey, perhaps that they, if they just wait and the ball went over, uh, four runs would be added to his score. They assume that the Greater number is added. No, if they going to conclude the game, it will be the one run or two runs that they needed. Call of over or time. Neither the call of over or time, nor the call of time is to be made until the ball is dead. So please make sure of this. Do not call time, but do not call over while the ball may be going over to the, over the boundary, etc. A lot of times, we 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 tend to with well, a bowler might say how's my cap because you can see the ball trickling over the boundary uh maybe there's no fine leg and uh, batter hits it down to fine leg and the next thing the ball says ah, that over how's my cap and you give it and in that you say over okay and the ball is not dead yet all right so just uh, make sure of this okay the ball is dead the ball shall be considered dead to be dead when it is clear to the bowlers and umpire that the feeling side and both batsmen at the wicket have ceased with regard to being play. Whether the ball is finally settled or not is a matter of the umpire to decide. So again, this whole thing is up to you. As you can see, it's your decision. It's your interpretation of when you believe the ball is, is dead. Okay, but it's clear, obviously if it's clear. You can see that no one is going. It's it's none. No play is going to happen. 
Uh, nothing more is going to be further take place, especially something on the batter wants to go down the wicket and tap and see some debris or wherever the ball bounced. Um, just just take make sure you take note of of that. So you'll see fielders start talking to each other, getting into a position. You know it's it's dead, right? That is obviously if the ball hasn't gone into the bowler or keeper's hands. Okay, now so that becomes automatically dead ball. Okay, now this is when you're going to call and signal dead ball. All right, so you. You're going to call and signal dead ball in these instances are coming up. Okay, when the ball has become um, has when the ball has become dead under law 20.1, the ball is an umpire may call and signal dead ball if necessary to inform the players. Okay, shall, shall call and signal dead ball. Remember, you'll call and signal dead ball. So just make the dead ball sign uh, or signal and you'll always say dead ball. Okay, in the unfair play. That is sometimes, especially when you want to go and consult. All right. Serious injury to a player or umpire occurs while the ball is in play. All right. So it doesn't mean now because the ball went over the boundary and in that uh, the batter was rushing and next thing tore his ankle or broke his ankle, etc. It is a serious injury, but the ball went over the boundary. You signal for you don't have to now signal re signal dead ball because of the serious injury. It's dead already. And then you'll get the medic to attend to him or her thereafter. All right, I just mentioned consultation. So when you leave for consultation and the ball is, you'll signal, call and signal dead ball to ensure nothing else further happens. And while we're on consultation, just make sure you do take the ball. Uh, it mustn't be within the fielder's uh, hands. It doesn't mean you have to have it specifically. You can have it just next to you. Just ask for the ball, um, especially if the, if the ball may be far away or, or if you're going to square leg and the point has the ball. You can just throw it to you or roll it to you and you just have it there. Okay, one or both bails fall, fall from the striker's wicket. So we sometimes don't get this a lot in Maritzburg. Oh, we don't have much wind here, just heat actually. Um, but again, if a, uh, are you at the striker's end and you see the bail fall before the striker has an opportunity of playing the ball, you just call and signal dead ball. You just say dead ball and then you try and re-put the, the bail. And then again, like we will get discuss it later on. But if you cannot play for with bales because of, um, say, it's too windy, things like that, you'll make sure that both bales, both sets of, of stumps that do not have bales if you want to play on. All right. And the strike, or oh, if the striker is not ready for the delivery of the ball, and if the ball is delivered, makes no attempt of playing it. Provided the umpire is satisfied that the strike had adequate reason for not being ready. Sometimes the bird might fly straight past. Uh, this flies in and around the batter, uh, things like that. And he, you can see genuine attempt. He starts swiping for bees or flies or whatever the case may be. And he cannot see. Even some sometimes a person walks in front of the side screen. Uh, I'll give you an example in Peter Maritzburg. The, the shed of the ground staff are directly in line with the side screen or they're at the side screen um, below it. And sometimes the, the ground staff, to the best of their ability, they try and see when the, when, when the ball is either dead or things like that. But it happened a few weeks ago where the, they were just oblivious of the fact and they walked out. Umpire called and signal dead ball. The batter walked away. I think it was Cameron Shackleton. He walked away immediately um, while the ball was running up and the umpire just said, dead ball. All right. So just take note of that, that you call and signal dead ball. Again, you'll inform the scorers, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, the striker, uh, oh, there we go. Distracted by any noise or movement in other way while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery, the ball should not obviously count as one of the over. So you call a signal dead ball, it's, it's re bold or it's bold. There is a deliberate attempt to distract, to deceive, or obstruct the batsman. The ball should not count as one of the over. You may get this actually in junior cricket a lot of the time, especially with a maybe an opposition coach or an opposition player that's that's just youngsters just being youngsters. All right, where they uh, where they try and maybe it's their friend or someone from the old school and they try and distract them. Okay, you get this a lot uh, where the bowler uh, accidentally del drops the ball. So I just call and signal dead ball. Okay, sometimes it cuts in, hands hits his hip or his leg uh, in trying to uh, deliver the ball um, and drops it. All right, the ball does not leave the bowler's hand other than in an attempt to run out the non-striker. So again, it doesn't leave the bowler's hand. He comes in and as he's bowling, he realizes, ah, I just see maybe the foothold wasn't right, whatever the case may be. Doesn't deliver the ball. You just call and signal dead ball. 
in this particular instance, you may get a situation where all four or five scorers you have in the score box, or especially at club level, you only have one or two, don't see that. And they think, OK, the ball might have been played or maybe it was a block shot. Maybe it went to a close infielder and it was a dot ball. So you will ensure that you call and signal dead ball and wait for their signal in this particular instance, especially so they know that it's still two or three balls remaining, however many left were, were left in the over or are left in the over. OK, and when an umpire is satisfied the ball in play, that the ball in play cannot be recovered, doesn't mean now you go hit it in the doozy rubber here in pitch Mansburg that you call and signal dead ball. It'll be while it's in play um, that you may lose it in a hole or anything. Anything can happen, guys. OK, and the ball ceases to be dead, so the ball comes alive, OK, or comes into play when the ball Bowler starts his run up, or if no run up, starts his or her bowling action. All right. So now we'll touch on law 21. Uh, is there any questions, guys, before I go on to law 21? I uh, please do note them down. And uh, when we will take questions at the end of the of the session, uh, and then we can just touch on that. And I can go back to any particular slide that you'd like me to um, just note down the the law that you'd like me to touch on. Um, uh, so if you say law 21, just state no ball um, and then I can I can go back for you. All right. So now we get on to no ball. Our favorite one. Every batter's favorite one in limited overs cricket. They hope everyone get. they hope they get the no ball. They get the foot fault, etc. because they want the free hit. OK. Stephen, I think it's Stephen Finn, uh, oh, if I'm not mistaken, um, where a bowler breaking the wicket and delivering the ball. Either umpire should call and signal no ball. If I, other than in the attempt to run out the non-striker, the bowler breaks the wicket at any time after the ball comes into play and before he completes the stride after the delivery stride. Okay, this shall include any clothing or other and any other object that falls from his person and breaks the wicket. So it can be a towel. A lot of the bowlers now like keeping towels. Um, again, I'll just say for I'm, I'm from Maritzburg, so I, I, I've witnessed. Um, and that's why shadowing becomes such an important thing, guys. All of you guys are here level threes or uh, prospective level three umpires. Uh, we even have uh, Dula as, as a panel umpire. will tell you this is how when shadowing you see things like this. All right. Uh, Keith Dudgeon. Again, I'm from Marisburg. So Keith Dudgeon, professional player, plays for the Tuskers. He loves keeping a, a towel in his back uh, because he he's quite fit. So he, He's in the inner ring sometimes, so he's always uh, running around with, for the ball. So he's he's able to clean the ball. So he keeps it on him. Once or twice, in his, the shirt comes out, the to towel also comes out. So if that towel falls, guys, from his person, so from his back pocket or back uh, pants, and falls onto the wicket, it will be a no ball. All right. Um, okay. So the reason I mentioned Keith Dajin, um, very good player, but again. Everyone thinks a bowler may think, not him necessarily, but even certain umpires think it has to be knocked over by the knee or by the leg. No, it can be any object that falls from his person, all right? A towel or anything per se. Okay, ball, ball bouncing more than once. Um, this changed recently or a few years ago, all right? Before, all right? So the umpire shall call and single no ball. If a ball which he or she considers to have been delivered without having previously touched the bat or person of the striker bounces more than once, okay, before the popping crease, all right? So before the popping crease, not the bowling crease. Popping crease is the crease where the batter stands, where bowler lands. So, I mean, that's quite simple. You guys have done past level one, so that was in your paper. But then, those years ago. So just remember, it's before the popping crease. So anything thereafter, sort of not and void or, or et cetera, all right? Bounces more than once or rolls around the ground or rolls around along the ground before it reaches the popping crease or pitches wholly or partially off the pitch before it reaches the line of the striker's wicket. When a non turf pitch is being used, this will apply to any ball that wholly or partially pitches off the artificial surface. So again, you may be doing a junior league final and, uh, and you know facilities are hard to come by and that's the astro wicket that you're using. All right. You may get a junior league player that bowls it off the wicket. All right. So if that, however big that Astro is made at that school, that will be the artificial surface you will use. So if it even they may say, oh, but sir, it's not a size of the wicket. That's what you are using. Making sure that it has to bounce within that surface. All right. 
And I think it stands to reason that if a ball bounces off the wicket, it'll become a no ball. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go on to law 23, which is buy and leg buy. And I love buys and leg buys because of the signaling. All right, so many coaches will tell you uh, they lift their hand and they while signaling a buy, a leg buy. Uh, but again, we, we know uh, that it's only by touching your leg. So if there are any coaches and uh, Vic as well, you, uh, you can go back and tell the coaches within the schools of that signaling. All right, so leg buys. If a ball delivered by the bowler strikes only the person, protective equipment of the striker, leg buy shall be scored if you as an umpire are satisfied that the striker has either attempted to play the ball with his bat, so it's not a shy away from the ball, it's a genuine attempt to play the ball, or try to avoid being hit by the ball. So again, I learned this the hard way, okay? If the delivery is a no ball, then the one run penalty for the no ball shall also be incurred. All right, so I learned this the hard way. I remember many years ago, I think I was on level one at that time, and the late Uncle Vesey. Um, again, that's why, guys, getting into matches and doing as many games as possible, even junior league cricket, um, helps you with everything. It's just time on the field, three hours on the feet is what helps. So I will never forget this. A player was trying to avoid injury. It was a school game played at the Oval. Uncle, the late Uncle Vesey was there. He was then retired from umpiring, but working as a as a staff member of KZNCU. And a player, he was watching the game, and a player tried to avoid being hit off. So it was a bouncer, legal bouncer, um, one for the Oval, whatever. And he better tried to avoid being hit. And I signaled, uh, I did not signal uh um, leg by, I actually called dead ball. Okay. And I said, no, Vada didn't attempt to, to play the delivery or whatever the case may be. He came and he said, read this line. I said, you try to avoid being hit. So if you try to avoid being hit, and you can see there's a genuine attempt of that, and it comes off the body. So he came off the player's shoulder, I think it was, or something like that. And he went down to find leg. They take it one. I'd allow them to take one, obviously, because, and then you allow the, and then you call and signal. But guys, it does not warrant if you if they try to avoid being hit, you will ensure that you call leg bar. Okay. And if you see the batter attempt to play the ball, even if it's close to the bat, guys, don't try and act um act innocent or try and act like a big shot. If he's trying to attempt to play the ball, acknowledge that he tried to play the ball and it was a genuine leg bar. All right. This is when you won't avoid leg but when you won't award leg buys. Hey, if the umpire considers the striker neither or hasn't attempted to play the ball with his bat, nor try to avoid being hit by the ball. So where he shoulders his arms uh, and he comes off his thigh guard, etc. If the ball has not become dead for any reason, the umpire should call and signal dead ball as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first one. So that's what I did. And uh, Uncle Vesey, like I said, sat me down and we went through it. So now for the rest of my life, I'll never forget that. All right. But again, it's in, in your opinion. Okay. If the umpire considers, so if in your opinion, you consider X, Y, Z, then you'll do what, 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 what is necessary. All right. Okay. Then you obviously will disallow the run to the batting side and return the not out batsman to his or her original end. So you'll return the not out batsman, the batter that's now on the non-striker's end to the striker's end. Okay. Okay, guys, we, we're going quite quickly through this. Um, I know it does become a long day for some of you guys, and you guys have mentioned you uh, wanted to have WhatsApp me that you guys will be leaving slightly early. But we'll touch on now fielder's absence and substitutes. All right? Okay, substitute fielders. The umpire shall allow a substitute fielder If they are satisfied that a fielder has been injured or become ill, and that has occurred during the match, okay? It must happen during a game. Again, we touch on the quiz answer or the quiz question uh, that, that Babs posted a few weeks ago when it comes to substituting a T20. Sometimes in club level, we always get two T20s in a day, uh, et cetera. Sometimes even three if you have a night, a night game at Kingsmead or at the Oval. 
So again, if the injury, the umpire shall allow a substitute fielder if they are satisfied that the fielder has been injured or become ill and occurred during that particular match or for any other wholly acceptable reasons in all circumstances, a substitute shall not be allowed, especially for comfort breaks. So many other professional players take this and you as a shadow umpire will always go and check after eight or nine minutes where the player is. Okay, a substitute shall not be allowed to bowl or act as a captain, but may act as a wicketkeeper only with the consent of the umpires. So in essence, he can field, all right? Fielder absent or leaving the field of play. If a fielder fails to take the field at the start of the match or at any later time, or leaves the field during play, an umpire shall be informed of the reason for this absence. So you as an umpire will note on the back of your card, uh, this is why I'm leaving, okay? Uh, X, Y, Z. Okay. You shall not thereafter come onto the field of play during the session of play without the consent of the umpire. The umpire shall give such consent as soon as possible. Okay. He shall not be permitted to bowl until having been back on the field of play for the same amount of time known as penalty time. So again, just read on through your playing conditions when the penalty time will start. In, in, in the sense, what I'm trying to say is that if a play field has been more for more than eight minutes, then you you take all that wording into account. All right. And then it, sometimes you may have it in a in a game with maximum 120 minutes, sometimes maximum 60 minutes, but for law. Okay. So if he's off for as per law, I say he's off for 100 minutes. All right. Or 120. Let's make it 120 minutes. He's off for two hours. All right. You will only count 90 minutes of that. It's only one and a half hours. That night off that two hours that he may have been off the field, all right? If the player leaves the field before having served all of his penalty time, the balance is carried forward as unserved penalty time. On any occasion of absence, the amount of playing time for the which the player is off the field shall be added to any time that remains unserved, and that player shall not bowl until all of his penalty time has been served, okay? So each time he goes off, you know that he's got time remaining. You'll again, you'll you'll ensure that you add it towards that time. All right, because it's carried over. So any answer, so if I went off for twenty minutes, I came back for ten. I'm going off again. I still have ten remaining. You obviously you build up. Okay, the period of time for a scheduled interval does not add to unserved penalty time, nor does it count as time being served. So a scheduled interval, so say you go for for lunch. All right, for meals. Doesn't mean now that he needs to give you 30 minutes. He needs to, he owes you 30 minutes of play. And next thing he's off for 40 minutes, like we did, like we saw earlier, the, the normal time for lunch is around 40 minutes. And, and he's now come back on and say, ah, I'm I'm in mean, 10 minutes in the clear because I was off for 40. No. All right. He still owes you that 30 or whatever time in that game that he owes you. Okay, if there's an unscheduled break in place. So now let's take an unscheduled break. So easiest one, rain. Okay, the stoppage time shall, shall count as penalty time served provided. Okay, so the time off the field will help him provided the following has happened. The fielder who wants to be on the field of play at the start. So, so the fielder who was on the field of play. Now batting. The fielder was already off the field at the start of the unscheduled break, notifies an umpire in person. So please take note of this. I will never forget. Guys, Babs mentioned it in one of the first quizzes as well. The captain comes and tells you, no, the umpire in person. So always go back, guys, read the almanac, read the law. Um, so when you read the almanac, it gives you the sort of the breakdown of extra wording or easier interpretation of the laws. All right. Notifies you himself as soon as he is able to participate and takes a field on the resumption of play or his side is now batting. The time before the umpire notified will not count towards unserved penalty time. OK, so the time prior to that will not count towards, but any time thereafter when he's informed you, you'll take it off his time. OK. Any unserved penalty time shall be carried forward into the next and subsequent day's play and in the innings of the match as applicable. A player's absence will not incur penalty time if he or she has suffered an external blow during the match and has left the field or is unable to take the field. 
So it doesn't have to include blood, guys. It does not have to include blood. It can be if a player gets hit properly against the chest. I mean, the inner ring fielder prop, you can see that that person is down, that the fielder is down and out. You can see it was a, it was a genuine hit. Guys, you, in your opinion, okay? Obviously, it will be an internal, yeah, external injury for that, all right? In the opinion of the umpires, the player has been absent or has left the field for other wholly acceptable reasons, which shall not include illness or injury. So this could be, for example, uh, just giving you an example for a club game. You you have a club game, and it's during sometimes now with the frosting month getting more and more closer during our cricket season during summer. So like next season we could have this whereby in March we we start fasting uh, earlier, and our league tends to finish at the end of March, and the player asks you, especially in the night game, I need to leave the field. So you'll discuss this beforehand. All right, um, and you'll discuss this before and the player needs to leave the field to go and play and break fast or open fast. It's a wholly acceptable reason, all right? Uh, it's happened before, so during the uh, end of COVID, when the lower when the lower levels came into play, um, we had a short, small league in Maritzburg, and it was during our fasting month, and at that time, the players asked to leave the field. So a player, Fahim Suleiman and Suhail Ghani, had left the field, but we discussed this before. Play continued because they had substitutes. Um, the club was quite a big club, so they had many players that came to watch and were on the team list, and and they came on and whatever the case may be. And we did not we did not penalize them. All right, we play continued just for the, because we wanted play to continue. Play needed to continue. Um, not everyone could stop for the whole time. And when they came back on, Sohil could bowl immediately, whatever the case may be. All right, so there was no penalty time. Then now he has to wait or whatever the case may be. All right, so I hope everyone understood that. Now you always get a player that returns without permission. It happens all the time, guys, especially with, when it comes to calls, cricket, things like that, the academy, whatever, players may not know the law. Okay, so if a player comes onto the back of back onto the field of play without the umpire's permission and comes into, contact, comes into contact with the ball, please, that's the operative word, contact with the ball while it's in play, the ball shall immediately become dead. All right? The umpire shall award five penalty runs to the batting side. Runs completed by the batsman sh shall be scored together with the running progress that they already crossed at the instant of the offence. Sometimes you get this where, where he comes on without your permission and he's on the field and he's uh, at the boundary sometimes and they've already crossed for two or they've done one and crossed for two. Okay, and then bang, he touches the ball. Okay, the ball shall not count as one of the over. Why? Why would you penalise the batter? The batter must have another chance of playing that ball. And the umpires will obviously follow the informing and reporting procedures that are stated in your bylaws, etc. All right, guys, we are going quite quickly. So I'd just like to, if everyone is all right with it, I'd like to touch on law 28, which is the fielder. And then we can get on to some questions and Q&A. And then from there, we can close off the session um, if everyone is OK with that. All right, so law 28, the fielder. Hey, fielding the ball. A fielder may field the ball with any part of his or her person. However, he will be deemed to have fielded the ball illegally if, while the ball is in play, he willfully uses anything other than the, the part of his person to field the ball. So again, he can use his stomach. He dives. Next thing, he stops it with his foot or his stomach for all that, for all that matters. Okay, it's fine. All right. Extends his clothing or uses the uses this to feel the ball. So it can be sometimes a lot of them chuck or extend their jerseys or um, extend their sh long sleeve shirts to try and and stop the ball. Uh, that is not allowed. This has a piece of clothing. So this happens in junior cricket all the time, where uh, or not all the time, but especially at junior level, they try and throw the cap. You cannot do that. So it discards a piece of clothing, equipment, or any other object which subsequently makes contact with the ball. Okay. It is not illegal feeling if a ball in play makes contact with a piece of clothing or equipment other than the object which has accidentally fallen from the fielder's person. Okay, so that accidentally comes off his head. Guys, please, he didn't do it on purpose while he's running. If he flicks it off forward, then you can see, because sometimes they all, guys love doing that. Sometimes they flick it off. 
But guys, while he's running, and you can see there's been no contact with the, with the hand with his hat and things like that, and he, the wind just blew it off. Um, please just take note of that. Is not willful. All right. Ah, penalty award illegal fielding. That you can see is bending down. Decided to decided to use his cap. He was too lazy just to pick it up there. Okay, if a fielder illegally fields a ball, the ball shall automatically become or immediately become dead. Again, why? Because you don't want illegal feeling to result to anything further thereafter. The penalty for no ball or wide shall stand. So you can have a wide, obviously it goes down to five leg, etc. Any runs completed by the batsman shall be credited to the batting side together with the run in progress if the batsman already crossed the instant of the offense. Sometimes, as you can see in the previous picture, maybe fairly close to the boundary there. So they would have had uh, maybe two runs completed. You never know. The balls are not counted one of the over. Illegal feeling doesn't mean that now you as a bowling side just get away with it. Okay, in addition, the umpire shall, you'll award five penalty runs to the batting side and you'll inform the reporting procedures of your union. Okay. So guys, I, I want to touch on dismissals now. Um, I would prefer if we if we get on that in our session for next week. All right, I am going to try and see if there's any, I see there is notifications in the, in the uh, chat column. I am going to stop sharing and uh, I'd like to just have a few question and answers if everyone's all right to do that. And then we can get on to dismissals uh, next week. Okay. So let's go back. I'll just put myself on mute for a few minutes uh, while I open up the Q&A session. Uh, Mr. Dawid Mehta, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, James, um, I have a few questions when we ready. Uh, sure, uh, we can actually start. Why don't we start? We got uh, myself. Welcome, Suhail. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that session. I have, where are you? Please, uh, Dawood, you're more than welcome to ask, and then we'll get on to Dane. Um, okay, I've got about three or four questions. So question number one, we said law, law is obviously 90 minutes, so I just wanted to clarify on that one. So say, for example, a player is off for two hours. So uh, if you're going according to law, uh, he can he has to serve base. I just want to clarify this. So he basically just needs to serve the maximum of 90 minutes. Am I correct in saying that? That's correct. So I'm actually just finding the slide, and I do apologize. It might seem a bit... <laughs> Um, but unprofessional, but I'm just going to just call up the slide, the fielder. Uh, just give me a second. I would actually want to get that wording for you correctly, uh, where it says buys and leg buys. Just give me a second. I would. Yeah, no problem. There we go. Okay, Daud, as you can see, I know my screen is a bit small. I don't know if you see that. Yeah, I can, James. OK, so it'll be a maximum of 90 minutes according to law. So yes, if it was off for two hours, you'll have a maximum of 90 minutes. So James, OK, thanks for that. Uh, my next question is when we spoke of now, when a player goes off the field. So say, for example, a player goes off the field for an hour. And um, so just before, uh, yeah, so I just want to, OK, so we got an interval schedule interval of lunch obviously and he hasn't okay so what happens in the case if say he comes on 10 minutes before lunch right and then now we go into lunch so how would that scenario work so he wants to now bowl so he comes on 10 minutes before lunch so he owed you correct me if i'm wrong he owed you 60 minutes before he came on before lunch you said an hour yeah, sorry. So he owed you 60 minutes. He came on so 10, minutes 10 minutes before lunch. That's a good question. So he's now starting to serve his his time off, his, uh, his penalty time. So he's starting to take it off, trying to shave the time off. So at the end of lunch, when you come back on, he will have to he'll have to give you 50 minutes. OK, so yeah, that's what I wanted to find out. So obviously that lunch would not be in his favor. No, because it's a scheduled interval. 
but it was an unscheduled interval. He was already on the field of play. So, yeah. Irrespective, he came on before lunch, or he didn't, so that wouldn't count into his favor, right? Correct. Uh, I'd actually like to touch on that. Um, Dula, if, if you don't mind me touching base with you on that one, uh, with, with regards to Dawood's question, when it came to the part of, um, of, of an unscheduled break, say it was an unscheduled break, and they are, he comes on 10 minutes before the unscheduled break, it starts to rain, so he's giving you 10 minutes of that, of that 60. It, the unscheduled break will also count towards his, his penalty time being, um, being served. Uh, am I correct in saying that, Dula? So say the rain was for 50 minutes, uh, he 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 owed you he owes you zero in the in up on coming back on. Uh, thanks for your question, Dawood. Uh, yes, Mohammed, if I can give my input. So so firstly, let me start by saying, when it comes to uh, penal, penalty time, it's only time that a fielder is off the field of play while play uh, is in progress. That is the definition of. Penalty time. While play is in progress, player not on the field. That's why when it comes to scheduled breaks, meaning uh, it's a break, play is not in progress. That's why penalty um, scheduled breaks like your, your interval, even your drinks interval, your tea interval, your lunch interval does not get added to the penalty time. So when it comes to an unscheduled break, and a player is off the field or a player still owes penalty time. There are two questions that you need to ask yourself when it comes to unscheduled breaks. So, so um, uh, Juma, if you can go to the next slide. The, the next one. So when it comes to an unscheduled break, uh, doubt, the first question that you need to ask yourself is, at the start of the unscheduled break, let's use rain interruption uh, as an example. You need to ask yourself, the player that owes penalty time, is he on the field, yes or no? So at the start of that rain interruption, is that player on the field? Yes or no? If that player is on the field at the start of the rain interruption, you will apply point number one. If the player is off the field at the start of the interruption, you will apply point number two. I'll use an example to illustrate uh, point one and point number two. So, player X left the field at 10.30, came back at 11, uh, 11.30, or for 60 minutes. Let's just ignore drinks break for now. This is just for example purposes. Of 10.30, came back at 11.30. So as player X walks onto the field at 11.30, what you need to do as an umpire? Firstly, the two umpire needs to uh, calculate how much penalty time player X owes, and then to inform player X when he or she can bowl again. So that's your first important job that you need to do the moment player X comes back onto the field of play. So as uh, he or she walks onto the field at 11.30, you write down player X returning off for 60 minutes. Now you need to calculate when player X can bowl again. You, you inform player X and then inform the cap, the fielding captain as well. So now player X is on the field for 10, uh, for 10 minutes. So at 11.40, it starts raining. Now you need to ask yourself the question. So you know you, so when it comes to an unscheduled break, you either need to apply point one or two. So now we're going to first use an example applying point number one. So you ask yourself, is player X 
on the field when it started to rain at 11.40. So our ex uh, example, yes, player X was on the field when it started to rain at 11.40. So now point one tells us, because player X was on the field at the start of the rain interruption, that player can now offset the uh, unscheduled break against penalty time that he or she owes. Let's just for now for, forget um, forget um, lunch uh, lunch interval. I'm just uh, giving an example to illustrate my point. So at 11:40 it started raining. So you ask yourself, was player X on the field? The answer is yes. Player X can offset the total amount of that uh, total time of that uh, that unscheduled break, provided that that player comes back onto the field of play once uh, um, the rain has stopped and and play restart uh, after the rain interruption. So that is the two conditions that needs to be met to apply point number one. Was player X on the field at the rain at the start of the rain interruption? Yes. Uh, player X then also needs to return with the fielding side, <coughs> excuse me, after the, or at the resumption of play after the rain interruption. If that is the case, you apply point number one, you can then offset that whole length of that interruption. Let's say, let's say it rained from 11.40 till, till 11.20, 12.20, sorry. So that's 40 minutes. So in, in this scenario, because player X was on the field at the start of the rain interruption, play resumed at 12.20. So that's a full 40 minutes. Uh, player X owed us uh, still another 50 minutes. So player X can offset that whole unscheduled break of 40 minutes against the penalty time that the player owes us. So meaning he owed us 40 minutes at the start of the rain interruption. He can offset the whole 40 minutes. So at the start of play after, after this, uh, the rain interruption, player X can bowl again. He owes us 10 minutes, so he can bowl at 12.30. So that is point number one. So the first question you ask yourself, was the player on the field, yes or no? So in our, this first example, yes, the player was on the field at the start of the interruption. Hence, you can apply point number one. When do you apply point number two? So before I move over to point number two, uh, doubt, do we understand point number one and how to apply it? Shukran, uh, um, Mr. Yankam, yes, I do. Thank you so much for this detail. Okay. Okay, great. So now point number two. When do you apply point number two when it comes to an unscheduled break? Again, you ask yourself the, the same question. At the start of the rain interruption, was the injured player or the player that owes penalty time on the field of play? And if your answer to that question is no, you apply point number two. So the difference between point number one and when to apply it and point number two is the player in point number one, the player was on the field when it started raining. In point number two, the player is not on the field when it started raining. And we're going to go through exactly how to handle point number two uh, because the player is not on the field of play. And I'm going to illustrate it by the use of an actual example. So, player X, let's, let's, let's give him a name, uh, Peter. So, Peter left the field at 10.30. Peter comes back at 11.30. Uh, sorry, P uh, Peter left the field at 10.30. And at 11.30, it starts to rain. So the first question at the, at the start of that rain interruption, one of your important jobs that you need to do is you need to check whether any field, um, fielder is off the field of play. And after checking your book, you'll see, yes, in our case, there is a, a, a fielder, Peter, that is actually off. So 10.30, Peter left the field of play. At 11.30, it started raining. So now a question you ask yourself, is Peter on the field of play? Yes or no? In our case, Peter is not on the field of play. So now 
you need to apply point number two. So point number two tells us if a player that owes us penalty time is not on the field of play at the start of the rain interruption, before that, uh, that uh, fielder can offset any of the unscheduled break against the penalty time that uh, EOC owes us, that fielder needs to personally inform either of the umpires when EOC is fit again uh, to, um, to, let's say, to be able to field. Once personally informing the umpires that, yes, umpire, I am now fit to, to, uh, um, to have taken the field again, then the clock starts in terms of offsetting the unscheduled break against penalty time that that person owes us. So that's the theory. Let's use a practical example to, to explain how point number two works. So Peter, off at 10.30. At 11.30, it starts to rain. Question you ask yourself, is Peter on the field of play at the start of the rain interruption? No, Peter is not on the field of play at the start of the rain interruption. Meaning, you need to apply point number two, so Peter cannot start offsetting the unscheduled break against penalty time, uh, 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 penalty time that he owes because he's not on the field of play. So what needs to happen before Peter can offset uh, penalty time that he owes? Peter needs to personally inform you that he's uh, fit, uh, that he's fit to, um, to, to feel again. So 11.30 it started raining. And let's say play can resume at 12.30. Again, just for, forget about lunch. I'm just trying to illustrate the point. I'm just wanting to use uh, um, round numbers. And I'm not going to use Peter left at 10.43 and return at 11.13. I'm just, uh, you know, using a calculator to do those things. I just You want to use round numbers just for illustra illustrative purposes. So Peter left at 10.30, started raining at 11.30. Ask yourself the question, was Peter on the field of play when he started training? No. So what now needs to happen? Peter can only start offsetting the unscheduled break once he personally informs you. So if Peter does not personally inform you for the whole rain interruption, none of that time Peter is allowed to offset against penalty time that he owes. Only once, Peter, if Peter comes to you during the rain interruption and tells you, umpire, I'm fit, from that moment, penalty time can start, uh, you can offset it against the penalty time that he owes. So, 11.30, it starts to rain. Play resumes at 12.30. Okay, but at 12 o'clock, Peter only comes to you and tells you, um, umpire, I am um, I'm fit to fit to play. So remember the it'll rain from 11:30 till 12:30. Can Peter offset that whole hour against penalty time that he owes? No, he cannot. He can only start offsetting once from that moment he personally informs you, which is only at 12 o'clock. So from 12 o'clock up until 12:30, that you can offset against penalty time that Peter owes. So because, uh, that's half an hour. So when play resumes at 12.30, as you walk onto the field, you will inform Peter that he owes us 30 minutes. How did I get to 30 minutes? Originally, he owes us, owed us 60 minutes from 10.30 till 11.30. So that was actual playing time. The rain um, at 11.30 started the raining, so that's not actual play, playing time. He only informed you personally at 12 o'clock, so you can only offset 30 minutes. So he owed you 16 uh, in total, offset 30 minutes. you now left with 30 minutes penalty time that Peter owes you, so Peter can bowl again at 1 o'clock. So, Daud, just to summarize, and you can let me know whether you understood my explanation, when it comes to unscheduled breaks, first question that you need to ask yourself is, if someone still owes penalty time, is that person on the field of play? If yes, 
apply point number one. If no, you apply point number two. Doubt? Did I answer your question? Do you understand how to um, how to when you can offset uh, unscheduled break against penalty time? O? Thank you so much for the detailed explanation. I think I have a, a much, much, much better understanding uh, of this specific law. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, the in-depth explanation of that one. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, yeah, you are, you are most welcome, uh, Daoud. Uh, Mohamed, um, back to you. Um, Mr. Senkam, Abdullah Senkam, thank you so much for your um, explanation and, and for your uh, input there. We really appreciate it. And guys, we can just see what experience brings. Um, I mean, we all hope to be there one day. And that's why, guys, I, have I keep mentioning, I keep hopping on the shadowing. This is how it, how we all can get experience and, and get to um, be on the big stage and be a panel umpire. And you can just see the experience. Uh, coming out there, Abdullah. Really, we, I really appreciate it. I couldn't. I don't think I could have ever explained it as well as that. So I really appreciate uh, you coming on this evening and and sharing your your uh, experience with the guys. Um, I, is there any other questions, uh, ladies and gents? Yeah, Jim. Sorry, two more, please, if, if it's okay. Uh, Dawood, your mic is still on. Yeah, I said I just have two more questions. If that's okay. Sure. With... Okay, so when you gave the when you gave the scenario of um, a player coming on without permission, right? So say for example he comes on uh, without permission, and he doesn't inform you, and say an over later he makes contact with the ball. What happens? Do you take action as soon as he comes on, or, or only when he makes contact with the ball? Now my my question would be: What happens in the event if he came on, didn't inform you, and then maybe? An over later only, he makes contact with the ball. How would you handle that situation? So that would, in my personal opinion, again, uh, Abdullah, I'll just touch on, I've never experienced something like that, so I do hope if I call upon you uh, just for that. Um, that would, in my, in my opinion, he, he has not informed you. So at the point of coming into contact with the ball, like the law states, you'd you'd go back and you'd, um, I'll just go to that that one, You'd, you'd obviously ensure that he, at that point in time, you'd call a signal dead ball and and award the five points and runs and follow the procedure there, because the law clearly says only at the point of contact uh, would, would would that come in. Uh, Abdurad, if I can uh, throw the ballot to you, uh, am I correct in saying that even though an over later uh, he had come on and, and he touches the ball, he has not informed you prior within that six balls prior. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question, uh, the doubt. So, doubt when it comes to uh, player returning uh, without uh, permission. So, so my my type of uh, of or my method of umpiring is I you know I try to work with the players. I try to to use uh, um, um, preventative um, or try to you know lots of players don't know the law, so I try to you know to guide them to 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 work with them. Uh, uh, but if there is a time where I need to apply the law, I will apply the law. I'll tell you uh, what I mean by try to work with the players. So the moment a player goes off the field of play, if he comes to you and says, Ampa, I need to go off, um, let's say, to have my hamstring uh, strapped. I then say, no problem, Peter. Just do me a favor. As soon as you come back on, just let me know or you can let... My partner, Muhammad, no. I will also speak to the fielding captain. I say, Captain, I see um, uh, Peter's going off. Just do me a favor. When Peter, uh, as when Peter returns, just let me know. You know, players are, are, are uh, many of them, uh, they sometimes forgetful. They, uh, they doff, whatever the reason. They'll, um, I've seen players swapping at fine leg or third man. I mean, you cannot watch every single fielder. I've seen swaps done at fine leg. I've seen swaps done during the, the drinks break. Guy was off drinks break suddenly. And suddenly, yeah, you see, oh, player X is back. You didn't even know. He didn't even inform you. So what, I, so what I do is, firstly, I tell the captain, when he comes back, please tell me. I tell the player as well. Also, if I do see a player uh, back on the field, 
um, and he didn't inform either of the two umpires. I'm not going to wait till that player touched the ball and then apply the law. I, I will have a quiet word in the player's ear saying, saying, Peter, I haven't asked you nicely to let me know when you're back on. Because, you know, the law actually tells us if you didn't inform the umpire and you, you touch the ball, it is actually five penalty runs, runs completed will count, including the runs across, the ball not to count as a one for the over. It's a fairly stiff penalty if you do touch the ball without in, informing me. So I won't, won't make a scene. I'll just whisper in the fielder's ear. I'll even whisper it in the captain's ear as well. So captain, I ask you to let me know when Peter's back on. Um, I see you, I see Peter. You know, luckily Peter didn't touch the ball. If Peter had to touch the ball, because you, you didn't inform me, I uh, you would have forced me to apply the law um, by, you know, penalty runs, ball not to count, runs to count, etc., etc. So I try preventative umpiring. I try to help uh, the, the, uh, the players. So uh, if I do see a player on, and he didn't inform me. I'm now not going to say, I'm, I will watch him like a hawk. The moment he touches it, now I will apply the uh, the law. Uh, I will I will remind him, as I just said, remind him and his captain. Okay, but let's say player X, Peter came back on the field, didn't inform me, and now suddenly uh, he touched the ball. Unfortunately, they now took the law, uh, you know, the, the situation out of my hand. They're forcing me now to to apply the law. Uh, they cannot now tell me, uh, yeah, but why you saw it? I, you can remind them. When Peter went off, I told you and Peter just to remind me uh, um, when he's, he's back on. You guys didn't. So please don't point fingers to me. You guys need to take responsibility for this. I am only applying the law. So to, just to summarize what I'm saying, try to work with the players. If you do pick up a player that return and didn't inform you, do not wait till he now touch it. Now you want to throw the law book in their face. Just work with the players. Educate uh, the, uh, the, the players. Educate the player. Educate the, uh, the captain. 99% of them don't understand uh, the, the law. They don't know the law. It's also a way of, you know, building a, a, a rapport with the player, with the uh, with the captain. Yes, the law. Uh, knowing the law does it say, yeah, you know, work with the players, help them. No way does it say. But believe me, building a rapport with the players over the years, if you try to help them, it just makes your life so much easier. If you throw the book in their face for every single thing. Uh, you just make your life so much, uh, so much difficult. So that's just my way, Dawood, of of handling that particular scenario. I try to work uh, with the players instead, uh, instead of taking out my stick, waiting for them to transgress and beating them with my stick every time I uh, they transgress. That's just my method. Maybe someone else will say no. Uh, um, it's not my responsibility to they should know the law if they transgress i will just take out my stick and you know and beat them with whatever the law whatever the law say nothing wrong i mean there's nothing i'd say they you cannot do it that way but it's my way i like to work with the players and and believe me you build such a great rapport with the players if they do see you as working working with them um, instead of taking out the, the law book. I mean, similarly, so bowler running in the uh, protected area. You know, work with the bowler, whisper in his ear. Now, just imagine bowler runs in the protected area the very the very first time. Now you take out the book and give him a first official warning. It just leaves just a bitter taste. Uh, you know, the bowler it makes bowler angry. Work with the bowler. Uh, by um, by just whispering in his ear, you're in, you're in. After you 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 try to work with him, and then you're still in. Then you can you know go over to. That's just my method of working with the, the players and trying to help them instead of throwing the book into their faces every time. I hope I answered your question, Doubt. If I didn't, yeah, you can let me know. No, no, you have. Uh, but just on a lighter note, Mr. Abdullah, see camp. Uh, I wouldn't blame you. The people from Cape Town are usually soft-hearted and obviously love helping people out there. Eh? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, you're most welcome. Uh, Mohamed, over to you. 
Uh, good one there, Dawood. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Dula when it comes to working with players. I think Dawood, there it comes to match management and player management on the field of play. Um, and it's, it's all about communication. I mean, you, you could get it at any instance. I mean, I had it at at um, Varsity Cup. So I was fourth umpire for the afternoon game, I think it was. in the So we, we split up in the 4.30 and 4.30 duties. Uh, so I had stood the morning game, first game on TV. So the general was running everything, still running through my body. Second game, first innings, I'm fourth umpire. And there was a strategic break uh, in the playing condition. So we had a strategic break for two and a half minutes, I think it was, or five minutes. And a player went on. Ah, so a player was off, told me, uh, came off. I was informed as a fourth umpire. I didn't do my job. I didn't go check at the eight minutes mark, etc. Hey, what the player is doing. Next thing, the player is on. Uh, my colleagues asked me, hey, did the player inform you? They, they, they saw the player. So they saw the player at, I think it was at, at maybe uh, square leg, etc. And my colleague asked, did he tell you to come on? They saw him maybe an over later. So obviously the uh, the the, the, bowl, the fielder must have been in another position or etc. And then they, they noticed uh, him uh, at that point in time. So again, they worked with him and then he informed them. Lucky he didn't touch the ball. So again, that's why Dula is... Correct. Work with the player. The fielder tells you, tell him, hey, listen, next time you need to tell me that you, you're coming on or just inform me uh, that you're coming on. So that, that's a good point on match management. Thanks for that, uh, Dula. It's just, uh, definitely it's just something we must all put into our matches. Uh, Dawood, do you have another question or can I go to Suhail? I promise it's my last question. Um, no, 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 please, please. Carry on. Last one that okay, so you mentioned, yeah. So, when uh, say, for example, a play okay, let, let's use this real life scenario, okay, let's yeah. So, realistically, a player is in the um, 30 yard circle and ball beats the 30 yard circle, player is obviously chasing the ball to the boundary. Um, his um, floppy ball comes off his head, he receives the ball before the boundary, and as he throws the ball in, the ball makes contact with the cap now taking into consideration he did not flick his cap off it came off uh, accidentally while he was running with the window whatever other uh, case it can be so with that um obviously uh, how would how, how would we look at that one that obviously is accidental am i correct or is there another way of looking at that oh, that would you come up with the hard questions this evening eh? um I'm I'm trying to think back to the to the scenario of I think it was um, the captain of England at that time. Um, not not Stuart Broad, uh, one of the captain at that time, Andrew Strauss. And I think he he slid, uh, got up, or Ian Bell and got up and he threw it and hit his glasses uh, again by mistake. Uh, it hit the glasses. Um, maybe it was not on on that particular instance, but. Um, yeah, if if it happened to me, I, w- I would uh, I would think it was um, by mistake. But Abdullah, I, I think you you guys had shown that video um, with the one with the glasses in the level one course, if I'm not mistaken, where I recently saw it. Um, Abdullah, would you like to come in there? I've never I've never experienced it where where it's something had fallen off and in mid air it it hit the it hit the um, the glasses or the cap. Uh, so I wouldn't. I would. I would take it as as maybe by mistake and and not award uh, five penalty runs, Dula. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Daud. Uh, Daud, uh, whenever there's a, a a scenario that uh, that we come across, we we need to we need to ask ourselves: Is there a law that 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 covers this particular scenario, or if there's not a law that covers covers it? Is there a playing condition uh, that covers a certain uh, scenario? So in uh, in your particular example, yes, there is a law that covers that particular example. And you've mentioned actually uh, um, what the law say. And the crucial word in that particular law is if a, p- a piece of equipment accidentally falls from the fielder's person. Crucial word, accidentally. And if that is the case, and if the ball, while still in play, makes contact with the, uh, with the, the equipment, like in your case, the, 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 the hat, 
that you will that will not be deemed illegal fielding and the reason is it accidentally fell off the fielder's person so crucial word accidentally and if yes not illegal fielding play will just continue as normal yes it, it might contact uh, with the with the hat uh, but play will just uh, um, um, continue as normal and the reason is fell accidentally off if it uh, if it was willfully discarded, then it's uh, it's seen as illegal fielding. Then you can apply the illegal fielding law. But in this case, accidentally play discontinue. Do you answer your question, Dowd? Perfectly. Thank you so much, gentlemen. That's okay. it for me. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Shukra. Oh, you're welcome. Over to you, uh, Mohamed. Uh, Dara, thanks for that. Yeah, it's a uh, like we all we all learn uh guys and i know me be presenting this course first time i'm presenting a level three course so again guys it's it's we all learn i would also have taken it accidental and um yeah it's good to hear for that that others also follow the same train of thought um we have another question uh suhail welcome suhail assalamualaikum guys um, and good evening uh abdullah this is a question for you um so far i've umpired three games in the in the league um, I've had cases where where, umpire, where bowlers will suddenly bowl and they will pull up their hamstring and then they will not be able to continue with the game any further, but they still stay on in a field. And I think I know the answer, but I just wanted a confirmation from the colleagues over here. Please, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, so, El, I'm not sure what is your question, question. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll let Mohammed answer your question. What is your question, sir? Okay, so what happens is, uh, let me use an example, Polsmo versus uh, North Pine. A Polsmo bowler was bowling and then he suddenly pulled up his hamstring or I don't know, he pulled up his leg and then he said uh, to the, my colleague that he cannot continue any longer with, uh, with bowling. But he, rather than going off, he stayed on the field. He carried on fielding, but somebody else completed the over for him. And this hasn't happened the first time. It happened a couple of times for me. Um, so I'm just worried that the bowlers might take advantage of the situation. You know, for example, if they're getting whacked and then they suddenly pull up a hamstring, but they don't go off the field. They stay on field, carrying on fielding, but they don't carry on bowling. Um, so I'm not sure what the colleagues or what. Maybe there's a rule and I'm really sorry that I maybe missed the rule. Um, so yeah, thanks for that uh, explanation. Um, look in, uh, in, and, I'll, and I'll hand over to Dula after after my opinion as well. It's also something that we can all learn from. In my opinion, I, if he's on the field of play, he pulled up. You're not a doctor. It could be a genuine injury. It could be a genuine uh, hammy. You'd get a bowler that hasn't bowled the previous over uh, to complete his or her over. And uh, yeah, he carry on fielding. He'll be on the field of play if he wants to come and open the batting. Is more than welcome because he's he or she has been on the field of play. So yeah, in my opinion, you're not a doctor. You can't say just because a person is getting whacked to that particular instance that they may be going off. Uh, you treat each game on its own individual merit. Uh, in, in if it's happened to you maybe more than once. Uh, yeah, uh, I, that's how I would interpret it. Dula, am I, am I correct in saying that? Uh, yes, Mohammed, hundred uh, percent. Again, we get guided by the law and the and the the playing uh, conditions that says if a bowler comes to you and tell you that he or she uh, is injured, you will allow the bowler uh, the over to complete to be completed by a, another bowler. So nowhere does it say, um, and because we're not medical doctors, so we cannot say, yeah, but I think you're faking, you're just getting whacked. Uh, that, hence the reason why I think you should complete the, the over. That is not in our powers. We shouldn't be doing that as umpires. We just apply the, the law, the playing condition, and it says, if a bowler tells you, he or she is injured, and you, uh, you will allow... Uh, um, replacement bowler to uh, complete the over, whether that bowler goes off or the bowler uh, stays on, it's got nothing to do with you. The playing condition and the law allows uh, for a, a bowler to be replaced if he or she tells you um, that they are, are injured. Uh, thanks, uh, Zuma. Back to you. Uh, uh, Sorel, are you happy? Did we answer your question? 
Okay, you happy, uh, Mohammed? Yeah. Uh, back, uh, back to you. Uh, thanks, Sula. Thanks for for that as well. Yeah, guys. Again, as well. Thanks for putting it out there. You know, it's something that uh, that not many might have known. Um, so yeah, guys. Just because he pulls up with the injury, remember he has to leave the field of play. So before penalty time and all of that. So just because he pulls up with an injury, uh, he can carry on fielding. Doesn't mean he has to leave. So thanks for that, Sohail. Uh, Sohail, your hand is still up. Uh, do you have another question or can uh, can I put it down and we can get to a revision? A one, maybe a couple slides of the revision questions uh, for this evening. Maybe we'll just go through one or two of the laws that we went through with the revision questions and touch on at our next session. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're just going to touch on a few uh, since the time is running out. Um, we'll just touch on maybe on the revision slides of, of the leg buys and uh, we can we can see how far we get and uh, we'll just uh, get on to a few questions. I'll open it up to the floor um, and uh, as we have Dula, you can also be able to give you guys uh, feedback. I can also give you guys feedback with the method in which you answer. So I'll just get on to the particular slides, slide number 11 and we can uh, get started from there. Okay, uh, this is the revision lecture. All right, uh, again guys, yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, the umpires Association of Western Province uh, for the assistance with this. I'm going to make it a bit bigger and then everyone will be able to pick it up. Uh, so I trust everyone can see that. So maybe we can start off with, uh, with Ben. Uh, ben, I'll read out the question and then you, you're you more than welcome to discuss and, and give your explanation um, as for the four marks that are allocated. Um, we'll do two or three other questions. Maybe Dane, Dawood, uh, you guys can answer here. Uh, you can answer and then we can we can close off the session. So Ben, for the for the first question this, this evening, sir, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, the bowler delivers an in-swing in delivery, pitching outside the off stump of the batsman. The batsman shoulders his arm, so hasn't offered a shot. The ball deviates back, hitting him in, uh, hitting him on his front pad above the knee roll in line with the off stump. There's a huge LBW appeal as the umpire turning down the appeal. The ball eludes the wicket keeper and hits the fielding helmet behind him. Ken, uh, would you like to have a go in terms of how you would handle this? All right, so because the ball is still in play because the umpire has turned down the decision. The ball is still in play. As, you know, it hasn't come to rest in either the bowler or the keeper's hand and it hasn't ceased to be dead. So, the it, as it's alluded, the wicket keeper, it's gone and it's hit the the fielding helmet, which is would, would result in five penalty runs being awarded to the batsman, to the batting side. Okay, hey, let's see what the answer has to say. It's a quite a nice explanation uh, that was given. All right. So if a ball, sorry, sorry, I'm back there. If a ball delivered by the bowler first strikes the person or of the striker, run shall be scored if only if the umpire is satisfied that the striker has either attempted to play the ball with the bat or try to avoid injury. If the umpire considers that neither of these conditions yet have been met, the leg bias shall not be awarded. If the ball does not become dead for any other reason, the umpire shall call and signal the dead ball as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. So that's half a mark. All right. You'll disallow all runs to the batting side. Okay. Again, return the batsman, any not out batsman. So in this particular case, it wasn't a run out or anything. A further half a mark. Okay, you'll signal no ball if, if applicable. So in this particular case, it was a fair delivery. Award any five penalty that is ex applicable except for protective helmets belonging to the fielding side. All right, there was no attempt of a shot. Okay, so there was no genuine attempt of a shot. So even though it hit the protective helmet, you would not award that in favor of the batting side. Okay, in this scenario, the fact that the striker does not play the shot at, at the ball and at the and the ball hits his or her pads, the leg bias cannot be scored. As soon as the ball hits a protective helmet or the feeling side, the ball becomes automatically dead, and there's no awarding of penalty runs to the batting team. Okay, so the no awarding of run penalty runs would be the protective helmet belonging to the fielding side. All right, so just take note of that. Um, 
All right. Uh, if, am I? Am I? Are you happy with that one, uh, Ben? Yeah, I, I completely disregarded the fact that he didn't offer the shot. So that's uh, the reason as to why I awarded those penalty runs. Apologies. No, no, we, we're all learning. Tula, I, if if you may come in here, if I can ask, um, when sometimes I know you you get a lot of the times where a batter shies his back behind the pad. And it could happen because Shai's is back behind the pad, um, hits him outside the line of off stump. So and and um, it's maybe a bit high in this particular instance. And you do say not out, um, and it, and it goes on to hit the helmet. Uh, in terms of field technique, how would you, uh, especially for the ones that captains that don't know the law in this instance, how would you uh, sort of get through it or, or handle it with with the captain, especially if he's batting and he's he is wanting pushing for that five minutes and hit that when it's hit the the helmet the moment we uh so when it comes to not offering a shot we get guided here by the law and the law is uh, fairly clear that if a better not offering a shot and the ball then ricochets and goes onto the helmet that was placed behind the keeper the law tells us that that penalty runs shall not be uh, allowed. So fairly clear law, and that is all you tell the, the if the batting captain is batting at the time and he, quest, he, uh, he questions it, you tell him law is clear because of the no shot that the striker, let's say he was the striker at the time, because of not offering a shot and the ball then ricocheted onto the helmet, in that case, the law tells us no penalty runs shall be allowed for ball eating, eating the helmet behind the keeper. If you had to play a shot, then you can tell him. So, so captain, if you had to play a shot or attempt to play a shot, and then the ball ricocheted from your pad onto the helmet behind the keeper, then the law allows for five penalty runs to be awarded to the batting side. But in your case, unfortunately, you didn't play a shot. Ricochet to the to the helmet, hence no awarding of five penalty runs. So no need to to explain. You just give him the law. You can uh, um, short and sweet. That is how the law is. That is why there's no penalty runs. There's no, no, yeah nothing to debate. Yeah, um, if he still wants to argue, uh, tell him to go uh, look in the law book under leg and under bars and leg bars law 23. Go have a look. Thanks, Dula. Yeah, guys, uh, Dula has explained it perfectly. It's, he should, he or she should not benefit from that. They didn't know for a shot. It hit the body. Went on to hit the the, the protective helmet. They shied their arms. That they're not gonna be in benefit of those of those five penalty runs. All right. So again, any other penalty runs could be like a no ball, etc., or, or anything as such. Um, so again, you'd 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 give those. But again, award five penalty runs for the protective helmet if you don't play a shot. You're not going to be beneficial from that from that particular delivery. All right, thanks, Dula. Uh, Dane, maybe we can head off to you if you can see that. I know it's lagging slightly. I do apologize. As you are setting up to the stumps, the bowler decides to de deceive the batter by delivering the ball from 1.5 meters behind the bowling crease. As now you are fo focusing on the popping crease, you notice through your peripheral vision the ball passing you on its way towards the batsman. So perhaps the ball is bowled behind you uh, in, in, in easier terms. Uh, Dane, if you are still with us, would you like to have a go? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, I'll have a go now. Thanks. Um, the way I understand it, uh, if he's bowling, if you up to the stumps and he's 1.5 meters uh, behind the bowling crease, then he could be behind you. If he's behind you, then uh, it would be a no ball because you can't uh, see his action. So you would call and signal no ball um, as the ball's being bowled. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, I believe you would. Uh, let the let the batsman continue to play the shot though. 
okay, let's let me go into a full explanation. So your call and signal dead ball, dead so not ball, no yeah. ball, okay, because you can't see what yes, yeah. occurred behind you. Okay, the ball will not count as a legal delivery. So if you're looking at four points, right? You need to get four marks. Explain your four four actions. All right. Uh, explain your actions in full. All right. So you call and signal dead ball. All right. The ball will not count as a legal delivery in that over. So it doesn't benefit the bowling side just because it happened behind you. It needs to, even though he may think it's a legal delivery, you get it re bowled. Any run scored or attempted in that delivery are to be disallowed. Okay. Because you don't know what occurred. So anything there after after the the throw or after the ball has been bowled in inverted commas, you'll you'll ensure nothing occurs. Okay, you return the batters to the original ends if necessary. So they may have run one or whatever the case may be. And then you warn the ball that any further deliveries bowled from behind the umpire will be considered as time wasting because that they are. I mean, it's it stands to reason that they need to bowl in front of you. And, and you also consider standing back from the stumps to prevent the bowler from bowling from behind you. So if you already are and you are and 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 again, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna just give an example. And I watched the Western Province Umpire Association and Dula in specific that did an outdoor session last week. And I stand 12 steps from behind the stumps, my foot over the other, just like how Dula did in the video. I think Dula said 13 steps. It's just how I am. I'm already back from the stumps. So, yes, you may get a situation where you with a spinner, you stand maybe uh, maybe 10. I'm just giving an example. And he, he is that sort of um, maybe closeness or whatever you want to call it. You can consider moving back. But if you're already 12, 13 steps, um, you're already quite, quite back. So, again, if you're standing up and that's your routine, you just stand, again, just a little bit back and give him... Uh, a bit of distance as well towards the crease to to bowl. Um, so you'd say obviously dead ball. So just uh, in that you may get half a mark for either each of the others, uh, but just consider consider that first part where it was a no ball. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so Hale, maybe you'd like to have a go on this one. I see Vic unfortunately has dropped off the call. Um, so Hale, maybe you'd like to have a go. OK, again, similar question. The striker does not attempt to play the ball. The ball strikes him on his pads and deflects off to the short leg fielder, a short fine leg fielder a position. The non-striker calls for a quick single before the non-striker can make his crown. The striker's end wicket keeper has broken the stumps of the ball. Um, there is an appeal by the fielding team for a run out. Uh, so, Hill, uh, if you are still with us, I think you are. Uh, would you like to have a go with this one with regards to the wicket keeper's end uh, breaking the stumps with a run out? Um, I would have probably signaled a uh, dead ball and then I would give a signal. I mean, I would, and I would say not out. And then. Sorry, you can carry on. Thanks, Dan. I just there's a lot of background noise. That's why my mics are off. No problem. Okay, so here, in this particular scenario, if the umpire feels that leg buys are not to be awarded and the ball does not become dead for any other reason, the umpire should call a single dead ball as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. Okay. In this scenario, the non-striker should be given out a run out. Okay. You'd obviously the non-striker now reaching the striker's end will be given run out because if you look at point one where or the completion of the first run. So again, once it's reached the boundary, you call signal dead ball. So it comes off his leg, goes to the boundary, call and signal dead ball, return the bats into the original end ABC. However, in this particular case, it was the completed of the first run. So in the first run, in the completion of the first run, it was run out. So in this scenario, the non-striker should be given uh, given out, run out, as the ball only becomes dead at the completion of the first run. So this was not a completed run. Okay, no runs are to be no runs are scored, and the incoming batsman will be on strike for the next ball. Okay, because the run out happened at the striker's end, and you would be you would then be given uh, the next the strike for the next delivery. Obviously, with maybe end of the over. Then, all right, is everyone happy with that? All right, so just take note of that. 
that it has to be com the completion of the first run. And a run out does not deem it completed. It means incomplete. Hence, hence you are hence you are not uh, you you have not completed and you are run out. All right, so Hale, are you happy with that? Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see it has reached eight o'clock, and and a few of our members have also left the session. I, I will touch on the the other revision questions um, with regards to ball bounty more than once, and and etc. In the start of our next session. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for this evening's session, but first and foremost, I'd like to thank Abdullah Stienkamp for his uh, presence in our in our meeting this uh, in our in our training this evening. Uh, Abdullah, uh, just from my side, um, thank you for all your uh, assistance and expertise over the getting to this point. And um, yeah, before I close, if there's any closing remarks from yourself, uh, I hand over to you. No, it's my pleasure, Mohammed. It's always nice. I enjoy sitting in uh, uh, these uh, sessions. Thank you so much for extending the the invite uh, to me. If I am available, I will definitely be sitting in in your in your other sessions as well. It is always so informative sitting in these sessions. You'll be surprised how uh, um, the things that you pick up and the things that you you learn in. In any of the levels, I, I sit in level ones, level twos, level threes, any sessions that's available. If I'm available, I do I do sit um, in them. So once again, yeah, thanks for the session, um, for, for the invite. Um, I'm not your sessions next week. If you can send me the invites and if I am available, I'll definitely pop in. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your, your evening as well as the other attendees. Uh, it was so nice meeting the um, you guys, Tao, Dane. Um, who's the other one? Uh, how do I pronounce that name, um, Juma? Uh, Nikhil, Nikhil Sanka. Nikhil, yeah. Uh, nice to meet you guys and I'll, I'll, I'll probably see you guys or I'll be in one of your sessions next week as well. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, sir. Much appreciated evening, guys. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And Dula, all the best with the with the One Day Cup matches coming up. Uh, have a fantastic one, and we're all wishing you well as well. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Take Bye, care, everyone. everyone. Bye. Good night.